Hello! Welcome to this tutorial on programming Chia Lisp with your host, Adam Kelly. Our tutorial is inspired by that old favorite, 99 bottles of beverage on the wall. I'll assume you have the CLVM tools installed. Let's start. First, we need a way to print the result of the program. Now, the Chia Lisp compiler uses the command run and it prints the final value calculated. So let's take a look at a few examples. All right, so that's how to run the Chia Lisp compiler. Now for the lyrics. Our song will include phrases like n nodes on the net, where n is an integer. So let's try to compute that string first. Okay, we got a string back, what looks like a string. So let's go over a few things. First, the parenthesis. Why did I put parenthesis there? Well, this is a Lisp-like language, and as such, it deals with lists a lot. Lists are bracketed by parenthesis, and generally in execution context, the first thing in the list is the function that is being run. So for us here, you see that's Q. That's shorthand for quote. All of the opcodes in CLVM are almost all in the low level are single letter expressions. So what this full expression is saying is don't execute and return the thing on the right, where the thing on the right is this string. Let's cover what this dot is. Back when Lisp was created, the main data structure was, and still is, a two-cell structure called a cons box. Usually it's implemented as two pointers, but the key is that a cons box can refer to two other objects in the language, one on the left and one on the right. So this is a holdover from the syntax that Lisp had. It's called dot notation, and that denotes just a single cons box. It can be a bit confusing, so we may explain this more later. But for now, just accept that Q and then a dot and then something means a cons box with Q in the first position. So let's try a few other examples with other values. All right, so you see in general, Q just returns what's on the right side of the cons box. These two parentheses following each other are another bit of confusing Lisp syntax. And the name of this value is nil. It's a special value and it actually is not a cons box or a list. Just keep in mind that whenever you see open paren, close paren, that's actually a value. And in the CLVM, it's equivalent to zero. So. Let's try this one more time. Okay, so you see zero is the same thing as nil. But now we need the ability to be able to change this number. Right now, we've just typed in a static string. That's not very interesting. That's barely a program. So we're going to need a way to change this value. There are a couple of ways to do this. You could compute that value as two separate bits of string. You could count this up independently from the second digit, but we're going to use real numbers. So give a try at composing this in a more programmery way. Okay, what if we just type out 99 and then the string? Let's see what that gives us. Okay, so what we have here is a list. The first element is the atom 99. And the second is the atom, this string. So this is good. It's clear that we could change that if we want, now that they're separate, but it's still not really changing it programmatically. Also, we have the problem that we'll want to join these back together because we want to end up with just one string at the end. Let's take a look at chialisp.com. Okay, concat. That sounds good. Let's try that. Okay, a few things are different. So notice that we don't have the queue. The reason is that we now have a function that we're calling that will produce a value. So we don't need to treat this inner list specially by quoting. We can just call the concat function on it. So you see like in Lisp, to call a function, you start with the open paren, 
you name the function, and then you just list the variables there like that. This is equivalent to the call in other languages like C or Python. So just a little syntax difference. It does add up when they get nested though. So let's run this and see what it does. Okay, so no type issues. It concatenated, but it interpreted 99 as C. The ASCII value for lowercase c is 99. What this did is just concatenate these two atoms together. And because it was a very long atom, the interpreter thought, well, I'll just display this as a string. It's probably a string. Okay, so we're making progress, but that's not very useful. We need the ASCII representation of 99. First of all, though, this program is starting to get a little long. One more expression, and this will no longer be a one-liner. So let's put this in a file. There's a program. Let's run that. So you see anything that you have on the command line, you can just stick in a file and then call run that file name. Okay, now we need a function that takes a number and goes to string. Our goal is to convert a two-digit decimal number to its ASCII representation. So first of all, we have to be able to break the number apart so that we can compute the digits. Let's go to chialis.com and look at that, divmar. That should allow us to break up the integer so that we can get at each individual digit. We see that divmod has broken 56 into something, f and six. Okay, equals a nine. Hmm. And why is it doing this? Atoms in CLVM do not have a type. The only way that they're treated differently is if an atom's position in the list is the first position. We can see that divmod 6710, and that the output of that is equivalent to 6, 7. So for some reason, CLVM thinks that 6 is R. And in fact, the atom 6 is the opcode R, which is rest, as in first and rest. Because we don't have types in CLVM, there are a few quirks in the output where the interpreter has to make a decision on how to display the output. But the internal representation is the same. It's not changing the internals, it's just changing how it displays them to us. Keep that in mind when you see an odd output, especially if it's a low numbered atom and especially in the first place. Okay, so divmod definitely breaks numbers up and you see it returns the remainder as well. How do we convert a digit to its ASCII representation? Well, that's easy. We just add 48. So let's use addition 48 and let's choose 9. Okay, 57. You might say this is a number. Well, in the CLVM, there are only atoms. Each atom has a length and a value. And this is a very short atom. It's one byte, and the system assumes you want to see it as 57. But let's concatenate that with something longer. So you see, we nest this call as the second argument to concat here. So the two calls are this one, and this one. This is evaluated, replaced by its value, and then concat is run. Let's see what that gives us. Okay, so you see it is the ASCII for nine. Let's continue. Let's start to write int to stir. This will be the first time that we use modules. So if you have a piece of CLVM code that you want to put your main entry point in, the incantation at the top of the file is mod, that stands for module, and then you write the code down here. Let's take what we just learned about converting numbers into characters and write a function. Chialisp takes its function definition syntax from Lisp, and we have a simplified version of defin. Define function. 
digit to char. Now the arguments list. We're just going to have one. And now the function body. This is where in a language like C you might open a scope and start to type the statements in here. But we know that we're going to open a parenthesis. We add 48 to D. And that's it. The last computed expression is the return value. Now we have to match up with this paren here. So let's complete that definition. Now that's a complete valid module. This isn't going to do anything though. And if we attempted to run this with the CLVM with the Chialis compiler, we'd get an error. That's because there isn't actually any code in here. It's just a definition. So let's also call digit to char and we'll just use nine again. Let's run that. Okay, same as before, except now we have a function. Let's see if we can take what we learned about splitting numbers up and try to do more than one digit. We want something like this. We want to call integer on a multi-digit number and have that return our string. Semicolon is the leader for comments. It's the equivalent of hash in Python or slash slash in C++. How do we get that? First, we're going to have to split the number up. So let's start our definition. And we remember divmod will split the number up for us. We're going to divide by 10. That'll give us the tens digit and then the ones digit in the remainder. So the output of this function will just be a dotted pair with the two digits. So let's, let's run that. So we should get a dotted pair with one and two. And we do. Why is it displaying one and two instead of some random letters? That has to do with the compilation process. Because we are in a module now, the output of compilation will be a quoted value. Let's just not worry about that for now. We've got our two digits. We're really quite far along. Now we want to make these into a string. So first we want to split that up. Then we want to convert those. And then we want to join them back together again. So let's see if we can do that. Okay, so first split them out. What comes out of this expression is a dotted pair with two things in it. And the way we get at that is with two functions called first and rest. They're abbreviated to F and R respectively. So let's try one of them. Let's just try first. Okay, so what this says is split up n into the tens digit and the ones digit, return that, then pick off the first one, then return that whole thing. So what do you think we'll get out of that? Let's see. All right, just the first digit. Let's try rest. the second digit. Now let's try rest. Okay, that's the one from the tens digit of 12, and that's the two from the units digit. So we've got a couple of functions here. Now we need to combine these and create the string that we want. So we're going to have to use both that first and the rest function. What we'll do is reformat this a little. Now we have two calls into divmod. The first call isolates the first part of the return and the second the second. Now that we have those individually, we can call our digit to char on them. But before we do that, Let's take a look at what this would return. Keep in mind that a lot of functional languages with Lisp syntax don't have a return statement. The last computed expression is the value returned. Let's see what happens. Well, that was just an aside about what might happen if you left this as is. Let's call digit to char on these numbers. It's the first call. You can see 
without indentation becomes very important in these parentheses placed languages. So now we have two separate expressions that should convert that one and that two into chars for us. Well, we want to combine them. Let's take a look at chialisp.com and see if there are any combining. Of course there is concat. Which we will probably ultimately need. But I want to introduce you to something called cons. So C is the cons operator in Chialisp. What that does is it allows you to create these dotted pairs. And those dotted pairs ultimately are the building blocks for lists, which we'll get to in later tutorial. But for now, since we have two Chialisp objects at hand, Let's see how that works. So we're going to call cons, so we know that has to be the first element of this list. That means that function will be called. And then the two arguments will be the two values that we just computed. This expression is currently equivalent to cons of 1 and 2, but we call digit to char on it, so that's actually 1 plus 48 and 2 plus 48. So it just lets you see all in one line what, what I expect the outcome of this to be. So let's run that. It's pretty good. We'll come back to cons in just a bit. For now though, we saw earlier that concat will let us build up strings. And we know that we have the proper values now because we've converted them with digit to char. So let's just call concat directly. So this will concatenate the bytes 49 and 50 together. Now, so to test that this is what we think it is, let's just run that on the command line. Yes. The reason it's showing up as an int is because the heuristic from the output of the interpreter is saying this is only two bytes. They probably want to see it as an int. You can work around that like this. So we can be sure that computed what we wanted it to. So this is great. Let's remove this comment and maybe put in a more useful one. Yeah. So we now have an int to string to use. Now we have the ability to build up strings and to convert small numbers to strings. Let's work on the enumeration part of this project. We know we want to count down from 99 to 0, so we're going to need subtraction. So let's see how to do that. The way to subtract numbers in GLISP is with subtraction function opcode. Start with 99, subtract 1. Okay, whenever a function is called, it's always the first element of the list. That includes functions with any naming scheme. Symbols, letters, even numbers can be functions. Plus, of course, you saw divmod. These are all just different functions to Let's start a new file. So we're going to be running this from the command line as we build it up. Let's start a module. So we're going to define a new function with defin called countdown single argument n, and now we'll just return n. Okay, let's call countdown just to make sure it's working. Okay, good. Now to build up a list, first of all, Let's see if we can just evaluate a list. So let's just return a list ourselves. So we'll start with Q. The reason the Q is there is because if I started my list like this, what Chialis compiler sees is a function called 99 with two arguments, 98 and 97. So if I ran this right now, it would tell me, I don't know what function 99 is. Let's do that just so we can see what that error message looks like. Okay, see down here, can't compile this list starting with 99, unknown operator. And the unknown operator it's talking about is that 99. So if you see that, you know that you're evaluating a list that you didn't want to. So let's use Q. Q 
stands for quote, and what it does is it takes its second argument and returns it. So it's kind of like a no-op, but it returns the value in the second position of the dotted pair. All right, so we know we can make a list. We know we can use subtraction. So how are we going to make an arbitrary list? Well, we need to define our starting point. We need to define how to get the next element, and we need to define the stopping point starting point is n. Let's define how to get the next element. So we'll call this decker for decrement. And we'll just define that like we did on command. We'll take n, we'll subtract 1, and just return that. So let's test decker. So we see countdown is being defined but not called. The function we're calling is decker. what we expect, 98. Good. So we have a way to pass in the start value. We have a way to get the next value, but how do we tell it when to stop? We're going to use if to distinguish the two cases in countdown. The I need to get the next element case or the I'm already there case. If we look at chillisp.com, we see that there's an operator called I. And that is the low-level if implemented in the CLVM Chialis virtual machine. We're going to use a slightly higher level construct that's built in the Chialis compiler called if. So we don't have to build that. Okay, so first we're going to use equality. So is n equal to zero? That's going to be one branch. And then the other branch is going to be the branch where we decrement. So let's break this down a little, see how the equals expression works. Equal one. Okay, so one is true for us. Now, are these two equal? They are not. And what is this? Traditionally, the false value is called nil in Lisp, and it's written as these two parentheses. The parentheses have nothing to do with the parentheses that enclose expressions. They're just the way to write false or zero. And that's exactly equivalent. Let's convince ourselves of that. Okay, so please print zero. And please print nil. They are the same. So now we know how the equals test works. Now we need to learn how to build up lists. One way to build up lists is with the cons operator. Let's do a couple of tests here. Those are the representations for A and B. And you see they came out as a dotted pair. That's because cons makes a dotted pair. Now to make a list, you need to terminate that with nil. Let's try making a list of one element. That's a good list. Now to extend this list, go out to the left like this. And you can see that telltale lisp nesting is starting to happen right here. That's how we add things on. So let's take this ability and experiment with it a little over here. So we're just going to quickly test our ability to make lists. I'm going to make a function called join two. It's going to take two arguments. It's a slight detour just to get the hang of lists with the cons operator. Okay, so we know we've got to add in a and b and the nil at the end. Each cons box has two cells. The first cell is going to have a and what amounts to a pointer to the next cell. That cell is going to have B and then the nil. So let's program that in. Cons of whatever A is. And in the second position of that first box, the cons of B with nil. Close that cell. It may look a little confusing, that's why we're going to test that out here. 
and we're hoping that a fully correctly formed list will come up. Okay, we recognize this from before. It's trying to execute a function named 100. So let's go and see what we did wrong. So what I've done here is I've added an extra unnecessary pair of parentheses, and that caused a function call right here. But what we actually wanted to do was only one function call and two arguments. So that's correct. Good. Now, the nice thing about having a function for this, as trivial as it is, is I don't have to write this complex expression in my program again. I can just use that for any two atoms. That's nice. Notice that they don't have to be atoms, they can be any object, which means either an atom or another cons box. Okay, so we can make lists now. All right, let's put this all together and generate a countdown list. Now we can begin to puzzle out what this would be. Zero is the end case. That means that we're not going to add anything more to the list. So in that case, we're just going to return the nil that's at the end of the list. This is the tricky case here. What we need to return is not just the computed value, but the structure, a piece of the list that we are adding on to the rest of the list. So we're going to use cons to take the number that came in, that's going to be the very first thing in the list. And here's where we put the recursion. In. The next thing in the list is going to be countdown. So we're going to call back in here, but we want to get something different. We don't want to call back in with the same thing, because then we'll have an infinite recursion. So if we start with 99, we want the second thing to be 98. And the way that we get that is Let's set our input value a little lower, and let's give that a try. Fail. Let's see where our mistake is. Mm-hmm. It's right here. Okay. All right. So. We've constructed the two cases for countdown. Now let's call it. That looks correct, but let's try another number to be sure. Mm. Let's set this to its full power. Okay, we can construct a countdown list. Now we have all the pieces we need to write the program we were trying to write. So let's see what we have here. Okay, let's go back to nodes. Let's remind ourselves what nodes looks like. That was our first attempt at concatenating that to a string. So let's clean that up. This is going to become our main entry point. So let's make this file into a module. Now, we need to use a function that's in another file. Let's look at int to string. Yeah, we want int to string. So because we're going to be including int to string and not running it, what we're going to do is we're going to make it not be a module and not call itself. I'm just going to import it for functions it contains. So we've made that includable now. Let's use the include statement. We don't need quotes. All right. And that pulls in that whole file. Now we can call in to stir on this. So remember, it's open parenthesis that starts the execution, name of the function, in this case, the single argument, 
and then where that closed parenthesis is, this essentially gets replaced with the output of that expression. After that first evaluation of int to stir, what you'll have is the equivalent of this. Okay, so that's what I predict the output of that is going to be. Let's see if I'm right. So that's a pretty decent error message. Can't open and then the name of the file. And the reason for that is we haven't given it the include flag. We're going to instead say run minus i and then the name of the directory. In this case, the directory we're in right now. And what that does is searches that directory path for the names of any files in any include directives. Let's run it again. And it works. Now we see there's a little bit of format in here. Let's see, is it fix? Okay. Remember, concat takes as many arguments as you please. So we could put the space there, or we could put it there. When you're writing real CLVM programs, you want to have them do as little work as possible. So fewer arguments is better, fewer bytes is better. So we're just going to leave it like that. Let's run it again to test it. Very good. Okay. So we've included int to stir as a library and used it. Now we have our countdown function. Let's see if we can harness that to get the output we want. So first, let's remember how the song goes. Insert some spaces. Okay, let's see if we got this right. I'm missing a comma. Now, from here, you should be able to include countdown.clvm and change it to suit your needs. Let's see if you can get a full song printed out in a single atom. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Join us for more later. Goodbye.